Now, here's another myth to get, you know, forget. It doesn't matter how high you go up in a tree, you, you, you're not going to avoid being smelled by a deer on the ground, especially if the deer is downwind. Because all human sense spread in, well, throughout an area that looks like a, a megaform, getting bigger and bigger like that, they spread downwind. They spread laterally and they spread vertically. And because they spread vertically like that, up and down, your scents are going to hit the ground not too far downwind to where you are. So just simply being up a tree doesn't save you from being smelled. And it doesn't save you from being seen as well. It, it certainly did back in the 1960s and 70s and early 80s. But by 1989, that was changing. There were all kinds of deer after that that were three years of age or older that were able to identify you in tree stands many different ways. So just to give you a good example of how where human sense go from an elevated position. Uh, imagine being out in your backyard and it's, you know, it's late, maybe it's, say it's November. You got a neighbor that's got, it's got a wood fire in his fireplace right now going. And you, and you stand there in your yard and it might be a nice quiet day like we have outside right now. So the smoke's going out of the chimney up on top pretty much straight up. But that's what you, the visible part. But if you're downwind, and you know, on a day like this, when it's really quiet outside, there's no wind at all, the smoke is spreading in every direction, all the way around 360 degrees. And it comes to the ground. You're standing there, and you see smoke going up. But ask yourself this, how come I can smell burning wood? when you're standing on the ground. Because there's all kinds of invisible molecules that make create odors that are falling to the ground all around you. And so you're up in a tree, the same thing as that. If it's really quiet, it's not just spreading downwind, it's spreading all around you, touching the ground. Now, you can fool a deer's eyes and you can fool a deer's ears, but you can't fool a deer's nose. So that's another myth to get rid of. I don't care what you use. Uh, you can use my Uncle Jack, he used fresh cow manure. <laughs> Before you go out into the deer hunting, you go stamp in a fresh cow pie. My dad stuffed his pockets with cedar, the greenery from cedar trees. And Oh, he said, that really works. That deer can't smell me. <laughs> and after that, I remember back in the 1980s, my sons and I started using a so-called cover scent. And it was a fox urine. And boy, fox urine has a heck of an odor. And according to the direction, we painted on our boots. They had a little applicator for them. Been on our boots and uh, before I go out in the woods. And for a while, it seemed like this fox urine was pretty good stuff. Uh, I had my boys approaching deer from upwind wearing fox urine, and those deer didn't react until they actually saw the boys coming. And uh, I thought, well, that's kind of amazing. So maybe it helps a little bit. But I have taken deer, bucks that actually followed my trail, sniffing my tracks, that, you know, they're all scented with fox urine, right up to my tree stand. And I'm standing there looking around, where did that fox go? <laughs> the fox scent ended at the tree. It, that was before the deer were looking up in trees. So we were, uh, we thought that was pretty amazing stuff until we got home. Uh, our vehicles stunk of fox urine. Our clothing stunk of fox urine. Everything's fun stunk of that. And the clothes had to go into the washing machine immediately. And I had to spend time getting that vehicle cleaned out because it was inside it just reeked of fox urine. You get used to it, you don't recognize it. But speaking of that, 
I had a brother in law. <laughs> When, you're, when we first started using fox urine, we thought, well, gee, that seems like a pretty good thing to use. Um, but he came up to deer camp and uh, and uh, he says, boy, what's that smell <laughs> in here? I said, well, it's fox urine. He says, well, what, what's that for? I said, well, well if you use that, uh, the deer can't smell you. He said, well, how do you use it? I said, well, you take a little swig before you go out. And, went, and by God, he grabbed that. I had to jerk it out of his hand. <laughs> you know, I was just kidding. <laughs> but he was ready to take a swig of sock here because he went, because you know, Uncle Ken and uh, and his kids they were always getting bucks, and he wanted to get a buck. <laughs> but anyway, in time, the deer got to it got to be really easy for deer uh, once they've been introduced to fox urine that to realize. And anytime you smell fox urine, that's a hunter, that's a human, and stay away from them. You know, that kind of thing happens with every kind of strong scent you put on your body or at your tree stand in time. It's what, it's what screwed up the, the ability of doe and estrus, uh, doe urine containing doe and heat uh, pheromone, it screwed that up, it got to the point where Deer in the woods, especially the bucks, you know, older bucks, especially the dominant bleeding buck, they'd smell that and the first thing they'd be thinking is human. Especially if the human scent was drifting in. Those things don't get rid of human scent, they just add to your human scent. You know, you can differentiate different odors, same time. you know, we're, we think that, oh, this is so strong you can't smell human scent, but think about this. Let's say, going to grandma's house for Thanksgiving, <laughs> and you walk in the door and right away you smell turkey, uh, turkey in the oven. You know how good that smells. Gee, you come in the house, and then you smell sage dressing, you know, or stuffing along with it. And oh, I smell a pumpkin pie, you know, and sitting on the counter. You, all these odors you, that you can smell at the same time, you know, it's the same way with deer. You can, no matter how you try to do it, you can cook all the turkey you want out in the woods. That smell is not going to keep whitetails from knowing that you're a human. Uh, most of these things just add to certain smells. In fact, here's another thing, you know, anytime you look at a product that says this is an odor eliminator, an uh, odor killer, open the bottle, take a sniff of it, it's not odorless. <laughs> you know, do you think that odor somehow magically disappears when you put it on you? No, it just makes it. It just makes it easier for deer way over there, and they smell that odor. Oh, that's the odor of a human. That's what humans smell like. That odor killer or whatever it is has its own odor. I hate to say that. I will never say you shouldn't use these products because anything that you can use that to minimize your odors, so you don't have strong and unusual odors that reek from your body, or your hunting clothes or, yeah, is better because the stronger and more unusual your odors are, the more, well, the more it's going to alarm a deer that smells it. If you don't smell badly and you're sitting at a ground, at a ground level uh, stand side or up in a tree even, when, if the motor, the odors that you emit are very mild and that deer knows you're, there's a human over there, they're not going to run to the next county. They're going to stay right where they live, right in their own home ranges, and uh, and they, they aren't going to they are not going to disappear. Although well, you might think they all disappeared because once they got you pegged at a certain stand site, uh, mature deer, three years of age or older, are going to stay away from that. They're going to not going to come any closer than 100 yards or maybe less, wherever they think that they can't be seen. They're going to stay out of sight of you. They might come by there every day to check to see if you're still there. Oh yeah, I'm still there. Now, 
if on the ground you've got a mock scrape going, <laughs> which they'll certainly notice, deer and bucks will certainly notice that smell, and you, but your human scents are going over there besides, and plus all these other scents that might be on your clothing, like the, the smell of coffee or the the smells that were in that tavern you went last went to last night, while still wearing your hunting clothes, you'll have all those odors on there, and pizza and hamburgers with fried onions and and cigarette smoke and cigar smoke and pipe smoke, all that being there or watching the game on TV, <laughs> everybody laughing and having a good time, but getting your clothes literally ruined by all these other odors. It doesn't matter what you got that's supposed to get rid of. You can dump gallons on it, and you're not going to get rid of all those odors. So, there's only one way to take that out of that problem away from it, from your hunting, and that's to always sit, approach from downwind or crosswind, or and sit down when crosswind or expect to see a deer. That would mean. No, you never don't have to worry about deer. You always come from downwind, for example. Oh, you don't have to worry about being smelled. Then you sit there. What about all the deer that walk behind you during the day? There's going to be a whole, probably half the deer in the area where you're hunting will pass downwind of you during the day sometime. And they can be a quarter mile away. They can be a mile away for that matter if you're, you're smelling strongly of unusual odor and identify you from those orders. Well, if they all ran away, the men said, oh, geez, over there, a quarter mile away, there's a human there. If they all felt like they had to run away, uh, go to the next county, or maybe head for that posted land, that posted farm over there, where humans don't hunt, they don't, we'll go there. Uh, or in that big cedar swamp out there, oh, humans never go out there. Or in that elder swamp, or that the spruce bog, places like that, or, or maybe that park over there, or that golf course, or whatever, uh, where people never go. Uh, hunters never hunt. Uh, no, they don't do that, uh, unless those odors are very strong, then they might do that. But, so, but as long as you're a stand hunter, the stand hunters are not aggressive. They don't chase deer around. Uh, they uh, they stay in one place all day, or one day, or a whole week even, or two weeks. Uh, they don't pursue deer. And these older deer realize that. So, well, we like stand hunters. Once you've got them pegged, we don't have to worry about them. Just keep out of sight. And, uh, we can make sure that we're safe from them every day by passing down window where we found them. And oh yeah, there he is, smelling of turkey and, and uh, pumpkin pie and uh, uh, maybe some fox or, or doe and estrus lure scent or uh, those kind of things. So, no. You, you can't fool the nose of a whitetail, but you can keep whitetails from becoming overly alarmed by how you smell by keeping your odors to a minimum and stand hunting. So, that's why stand hunting is the best way there is to hunt older bucks. Although, not the way most stand hunters stand hunt these days by sticking to one stand site for an entire hunting season and using some kind of a lure. Used to be, you know, we had the idea that, like the, the doe and estrus type lure scent, that bucks were powerless to resist going to wherever they smelled at. You know, no way they could. And it almost seemed that way. You know, I'm an old guy, and I've been, I've hunted during the years when that stuff was first introduced. And my gosh, you could use it any way you wanted, and there were all kinds of deer. Uh, that came that you would see that follow you even. Uh, the guys used to pour some on a piece of cloth and put it on a string and drag it along the way, going to a stand site. Then get in the stand and expect to see bucks following them along the trail, and it didn't happen. There's no doubt about it. That happened. But 
And then, you know, the way we would set up that stuff, we'd put it out in front of our stand, you know. Uh, and we're facing downwind, because that's where the deer are going to come from, that are powerless to reduce coming to that stuff. And they did come. But, boy, it sure changed over the years. And now that's pretty rare, except for uh, yearling bucks. Yearling bucks so they still do that. And they kind of convince people, boy, that's... Still works pretty good. Here comes the yearling buck, you know. But where's the big guys? Where's the big ones? Well, they're not coming to that anymore. So, so you, the more odors, you know, you go through all the process of getting rid of odors, washing your clothes with scentless laundry soap and hanging them outside for several days, uh, hanging your boots out there, doing all these things, using scentless hand soap and that kind of thing in deer camp and changing to camp clothes, taking off your outer hunting clothes especially, uh, and, and hanging them outside, maybe out in your truck or in the top, right in the top or something, and just wearing uh, well, camp clothes when you're cooking in deer camp. And, and the guys are sitting around playing cards and maybe smoking and that kind of thing. So you do all that, and then you add orders to your site. Uh, you walk over there to the trail where this buck has been making a ground scrape, well, making ground scrapes, or not. Maybe just, there's tracks made by big buck size, mature buck size tracks on that trail. Uh, three and a half to four inches of length for hope floating on that trail, and droppings, an inch long, three quarter of an inch long on that trail. And you say, oh boy, I'm going to put a mock scrape here. <laughs> so then you go over there. And you're doing this, you know, your hands, and you put that thing up there. And while you're doing all this, you know, and maybe clip a few branches out, out of the way here, between here and the stand side. Then you take time, put up the stand and all that. And you figure, well, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to, always, I'm going to come from downwind. Well, you'll find out real soon that, well, gee, the wind isn't from, I can't approach from downwind today, so I didn't switch 360 degrees or 180 degrees. So, well, it doesn't matter that I got that lure scent there. And so you go, oh, the kind of things you did. But what did you do? You put trail scent that comes from your body and soles of your boots, that rubber smell on the sole of your boots. You got it scattered all around the area where you're planning to hunt. And that trail scent, where everywhere you stepped, well, there's going to be a path maybe six foot wide, full of your odors. And it's going to last for at least four days, unless it rains or snows, meanwhile. It's going to last that long. And you come there the next day and you walk over to your, your and, and maybe put some more scent out there and doing that kind of thing, right on your trail. <coughs> there's all these additional orders you keep adding, you know, your more trail scent. Gee, you do that for four days, you got four days of intense odors that came from your body. <coughs> Any buck three and a half years of age or older will always react upon, as if it is greatly alarmed upon walking into an area where there's a lot of intense human odors. No matter what you do, or, or how much you do, to try to eliminate your human odors, they're still going to be there. No, you can't smell them, but deer can smell them. Their noses are as sensitive as the noses of bloodhounds. A whitetail can, ju can judge which direction you traveled by noting differences in intensities of odors from your tracks. You hardly will ever see it happen. You see a whitetail walk up to a trail you walked on, or someone else did, and they'll sniff the trail and they'll look in the direction you went. Their, their noses are that sensitive. So you're not fooling them. All these orders. And a big buck, you know, like the kind you dream about every year, they're not going to be fooled by that. Not only that, they're going to stay away from this area. They know this is an area that's being uh, that's often visited by a human. This is a dangerous place here. Don't want to come back here anymore. That's it. You know, person uh, hunters are saying, "Well, Buck never used the same trail twice in a row. I found this fresh trail, and, 
and uh, he's never come back here since then. Well, why is that? <laughs> well, there can be other reasons, of course, when does are an estrus, but a uh, good share of the time is simply because he had identified it as a dangerous place to be. So, when it comes to sense, just keep, remember, you can't fool a white-tailed dog. When he gets you by scent, he knows you're a human. No doubt about it. Nothing. That's not true of fawns and yearlings, but it's true of older deer. And so, try to minimize that. You know, let's say, you find this ground scrape, freshly made. Oh, look at the dirt kicked all over in one place. Boy, way over there, you know, and leaves and sod and, and moss kicked way over to one side. Under this tree, and there's a sagging tree, tree branch, and geez, this buck, he, he was going to make a real big impression. This is a no trespassing sign made by the dominant breeding buck. And it was that was he ravages a branch overhanging it, and pieces are hanging, broken, some parts laying there on the scrape, and they're covered with his scalp scent, his scalp musk. Well, there, all those things there, there, there's nothing in the world that can keep a buck uh, from renewing the sense and appearance of that ground scrape at least once every 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours, from mid-October, when we started getting freezing temperatures at night, until early November. Once breeding begins, he's not going to have much time for it, but during that time, nothing is going to keep him away uh, except really warm temperatures, unusually warm temperatures. Uh, that can really shut down uh, bucks renewing ground scrapes or making them. Uh, the other, other thing is it would be a very strong wind, you know, wind that's 15 miles an hour or stronger can make it, uh, keep a buck from renewing it. And it can be gusting wind or a storm, you know, a snowstorm, a thunderstorm, that kind of thing, or, that go, or thunderstorms that keep going on. And number four, the most likely thing is that that buck discovered something that, that, that proves this is a, a spot that uh, is being frequented, fre be, uh, being visited often by a human. Because there's strong trail scents on the trail over there, and you smell it way over there, the park. This guy was walking all around looking at tracks with, and uh, when he was doing this. And, uh, and it, it, all, there's all kinds of odors in the area that give you away. And, uh, and it doesn't have to seem terribly dangerous to the buck. He might say, well, he might have come by there ten minutes before you got to your tree stand or he walked by there during the night and, and got, you know, smelled all these odors and, and looked at changes. Or he might have been way over there about 80 yards away and he saw you sitting up in a tree and you moved quickly, you know, you're looking around up there. Or uh, you, you were eating peanuts in the shell. I found a stand site in the woods one year where a guy obviously liked peanuts in the shell, and he, and he threw all the shells on the ground out in front of him. I found tree stands where guys that obviously did a lot of smoking, and a lot of cigarette butts laying around there, and I found some where guys like to have, the, uh, you know, a few cans of beer while they're sitting out there in the tree as well, and they throw the cans on the ground, you know, pop them open and throw them on the ground. Well, could have, 16 bucks could live in that square mile. <laughs> Dude, by the time a guy like that is done for, with a day of hunting, every one of them will know he, this is where he's hunting and uh, this tree stand hunter and would stay away from there. Don't come in sight of that place. So, so there you go. Now, if you can somehow keep whitetails from getting excited about any sounds you make, you know, and I've talked to you about how to do that, or it can keep them from readily recognize you, you know, uh, by keeping your motions to a, a, a bare minimum, and uh, and also by having really good cover around you that hides your silhouette, 
And if you've never tried it before, you soon begin to realize it's a lot easier to find that kind of cover at ground level than up in a tree. And then, um, if just forget about the whitetails that are downwind of you in a day of hunting. You can't do anything about that. So, but it's the area out in front of you that, you know, that that's where you're going to see the deer that you're going to take each year. So, uh, and you can't do anything about that. But wherever you hunt, if you if you limit your stand hunting to one stand site during the hunting season, in a matter of a few days that wind has moved around and you, it's whitetails in every direction from around that stand site will have identified you one or more times from downwind or from your trail sense leading to the place. So, you know, my boys and I, we've gotten to the point now where we pick a stand site and we pick a lot of them at ground level, before and during on season. We don't mess around. We don't go within 20 feet of that trail. We, you know, we can you see those tracks in the snow over there, or you can see a ground scrape, or right over there, 10, 20 yards away is the edge of a feeding area. Ah, they, and they come to feed here. We've, been, we've seen deer out here, or when we were scouting earlier, we found all kinds of tracks. Deer have been in there feeding maybe on greens before the hunting season begins. And now they're, they're feeding on, you know, in the firearm hunting season, they're feeding on browse and all kinds of red browse out there that whitetails particularly like. So those things are out there. So we're, we're hunting in a place where the odds are as good as they can be for seeing deer. And big bucks, if we're keying on the kind of signs big buck made, big bucks made. I'm not talking about antler ups and grouse types. I'm talking about tracks and droppings, fresh. And uh, but then, but the problem with hunting big bucks, they're so good at identifying hunters, stand hunters, that uh, if you use that stand more than one day. Chances are you, you won't have much of a chance of seeing a big buck at that stand site the rest of the hunting season. We've gotten to the point where we change stand sites every half day, and I've said this before. Anytime we, we hunt at a stand site close to that kind of tracks, real fresh, and we don't see that buck in that half day, he knows we're there. It's time to go. We keep doing this, you know, we move, keep moving to places where they can't identify us by, by sight or sound, and only from downwind by scent, where we've never been found before, never been a human. There's no reason to worry about going over there in that area right there. There's never any humans over there to worry about. And so, sooner or later, we always catch a buck close, because they can't predict where we're going to be next. Now that we know we've known lots of bucks who make it a point to try to figure out where we are next every day, every early every morning. They want to find you, and some are so good at it that we finally give up on them, or try using a a group uh, stand hunting method. We have a couple of them I've talked about uh, to try to trip them up which often works. We've done pretty well with those, those two stand hunting methods. But so, keep these things in mind. These are things that make it easy for whitetails to identify you. And every day you hunt, you want to keep those things to a minimum. Make it difficult for them to not only identify you wherever you are, but to even predict or try, you know, I don't know how good they are at predicting, but uh, make it difficult, really difficult for them to know where you are sitting every day of a hunting season. Uh, you think you got to have this nice shack on top of poles with a good roof on it and even some, rib, uh, even some uh, uh, mirrors on the side so you can look back without having to turn your head off. And a nice place with a little stove in there, you know, maybe charcoal a heater or something, keep warm. Well, that's fine. If that's what you enjoy, you know, sitting in the woods and something like that. 
and that's fine. But on day two, <laughs> you know, you aren't going to, you're going to see fewer deer, and pretty soon nothing with decent antlers. You're not going to see. You know, that's just not going to work. But if you, you don't mind that, uh, sitting in a, oh, I shouldn't say things like that. But at any rate, uh, you got to keep moving if you're going to see big bucks, and you got to pick stand sites where big bucks are right now today. Not tomorrow, not three days ago. You're way too late then, you, you, that'd be a terrible mistake. So, this, this hunting method I often refer to as portable stump hunting, or one, one that I like the, the most is uh, opportunistic stand hunting, all explained in great detail in my latest book, and you guys have seen me hold that up a lot of times. Uh, all I've been try talking about is covered in great detail in this book and, uh, and the hunting methods that greatly improve your odds of taking the tour box. Quit letting old myths ruin your hunting. <laughs> yeah? The old myths that make you believe whitetails can't smell you or they can't tell what you are by the sounds you make when you're walking, things like that. You're just making it harder. <laughs> to take deer that are three years of age or older when you when you believe those things. So okay guys. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Gee, it won't be long now, you know, we'll be all be out in the woods hunting. And uh, uh, I'm just trying my best to help make it possible for you to put get a really big buck this year. Get a ten pointer that you can be proud of for the rest of your life. <laughs> And uh, they're so hard to get, you know. But uh, my boys and I, we've been doing really good. At, you know, we've taken, they weren't all 10 pointers, but we, we've taken uh, over 100 mature bucks since 1990 doing things like I've been talking about. So, honey methods are, are important, but even more important is your ability to avoid being easily identified by whitetails when you're hunting. So, keep that in mind. <laughs> maybe, maybe one thing is more important. Very fresh signs made by big bucks. I mean, maybe, maybe minutes before, hours before, you know, you got to this place. If that buck wasn't bounding or trotting, he wasn't alarmed. If he's just walking, walking tracks, he wasn't alarmed. And for that reason, this trail or this site, this vicinity, for whatever reason he's here, whether it's where he likes to eat or drink water or he's with a doe and estrus or, or uh, that's a trail he likes to use when he's going to a feeding area. Right? It would be obvious if the feeding area is right over there. Uh, if it's something like that, and that buck didn't realize you were there, this is something new, you know. He, you're liable to see him during the very next feeding cycle. The next hours they feed. So, man, one more. Yeah, I'm going to throw this one out. When white tails are feeding, like early morning, late in the day, you should be walking around. When you're walking around during that period and, and you're spotted because you're easily seen when you're moving around, all the motions you make of walking and sneaking and things like that or making drives, uh, you're easily identified by white tail, safe distances away. And uh, if you're persistent, you know, uh, in, their ca in a case like that, those white tails are liable to abandon their ranges for a while. Uh, the younger ones may come back within 24 to 48 hours, but older does even, and certainly older bucks, might stay away for the rest of the hunting season. When white tails are feeding, sit, don't move. Now you can move midday or early. Oh, they'll be feeding then too, but that's where you got to be particularly skilled at getting to a stand site without alarming them. When they're busy feeding out there in that area, 
you can get there without alarming whitetails. If you take all those precautions I talked about earlier, those of you who didn't see that, go back and check these titles. But there's a whole set of precautions I talked about that you should take when you're hunting older bucks. And more than 30 of them. <laughs> but anyway, uh, other times of the day, like midday, or when you're heading back to camp in the evening or going out in the morning, move then, but do it in a way that makes it difficult for them to realize you're a human and that you're kind of getting close to where they are. But, but when they're feeding, they're doing the moving. They, they're standing up. This is a place when you can see them better. You, you know, they're most visible. They're really hard to see when they're bedding. But uh, when they're up in the bottom, you can see them. You can see them coming sometimes quite a ways away before they're within shooting distance. So don't be moving around during, while feeding, during feeding. You know, it's our rule in our camp. We stay in our little stand sites nowhere until 11. We don't move out of them until 11. Then we go out in the afternoon and we actually get out there. We might leave camp at 1 o'clock. But I think as long as you're there by 3 o'clock, that pretty well takes care of the evening feeding cycle. But um, in the morning, we go out, we get to our stand sites. 30 minutes before first light in the morning. And people can talk about that all they want, complain and say, oh, they never do it for whatever reason. We do it because it works and because it's enabled us to take all those mature bucks since 1990. Wouldn't change that for anything. Okay, time, time to break camp here. <laughs> so, but I hope what I've taught you today has helped you a lot. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for watching, and you certainly aren't the only one. <laughs> I've got over five million minutes of people watching my YouTube presentations now, and over, uh, what is it, 5,300 uh, subscribers. And I hope you become a, a subscriber too, uh, and uh, also, uh, you know, push that little red button down there that says subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything, and you'll always be told about whenever I, uh, I uh, have a new uh, YouTube presentation available. And then uh, poke that little thumbs up button as well. And thank you for that. We'll see you again soon. And I'll say it every time now for a while, good luck hunting this fall. <laughs> I hope you get a big one this year. See you guys. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.